You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast featuring some of Indiana's most fascinating men and women whose impact has shaped our state, our communities, and us. Join us as we discuss their imprint on our history. Leaders and Legends is brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated, your local veteran business enterprise specializing in public relations, media relations, public outreach, crisis communications, and digital photography. My name is Robert Bain, Principal of Veteran Strategies, former Deputy Chief of Staff to Mayor Greg Ballard, and Communications Director for the Indiana Republican Party. I'm honored to be your host for our discussion. You're listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. Co-host Danielle Shockey, CEO of the Girl Scouts, is with us today. And our podcast is with two of the most incredibly (laughs) gifted young leaders I've ever met. And I guess they're younger than me, so I can say young leaders. (laughs) Uh, Ladies first, Shannon Williams, Senior Vice President for Community Engagement, The Mind Trust, former editor and all things bossy at the Indianapolis (laughs) Recorder. I love Shannon. She is absolutely amazing, and we have known each other for a long time. Very long time, yes. We are also joined by her boss, our boss, everyone's boss who cares about education in Indianapolis, and that is Brandon Brown, CEO of the Mind Trust, former official in the Ballard administration. I think I may have been gone. Yeah, we didn't 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 quite overlap, yeah. But he was heavily involved in the education policy of the Ballard administration, and the show's called Leaders and Legends, and the legend aspect of it sometimes means people are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. But the leaders part can be anyone. And what the Mind Trust, Mind Trust has done under David Harris and under its current leadership is changing the city just as much as any building ever did and any event ever could. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Danielle, who ought to really do everything in today's podcast, given her extensive education experience. Mm -hmm. Danielle. But it makes much more of an interesting show, Robert, when you talk with me. (laughs) So I will pass it back every once in a while. (laughs) So after Robert's introduction for both of you all, um, I still think our leaders need to understand a little bit more. Let's start at the beginning. First of all, for the listener who may not understand what is the Mind Trust, can you explain a little bit what is this organization? What does it represent? How does it work in our community? Yeah. So the Mind Trust is an Indianapolis-based education nonprofit. We were founded in 2006, really as an outgrowth of the mayor's office. Uh, So our founding board chair was Mayor Peterson, and he actually continued to chair the board of the organization until about a year ago. Uh, And it was with that civic leadership that the Mind Trust was really born. And I think out of the gate, we just had a level of credibility because you had folks like Mayor Peterson and you know, actually a large number of leaders in our city uh, all coalesce around a vision that we needed to transform the educational system and we needed uh, for more kids to have access to high quality schools. So the goal of the Mind Trust, uh, you know, really was to support fantastic social entrepreneurs that had a vision for new ideas to help improve education and for those entrepreneurs to get the resources and support necessary to translate those visions into reality. Uh, So really, from 2006 to 2011, we were uh, very focused on creating an education ecosystem that was conducive to smart people that were mission aligned and who had great ideas uh, for them to go out and to, you know, really see those ideas be executed. And what happened is that over time, the education system uh, had a growing number of really high performing nonprofits. Uh, We had a growing number of leaders who saw the education inequity in our community as a major problem to solve. Um, And we had successive mayors, Mayor Peterson, Mayor Ballard, and Mayor Hogsett of two different parties. Uh, work to kind of extend the leadership out of the mayor's office now for almost 20 years. 
And what has created is we have an education policy environment that's second to none in the entire country. And the Mind Trust is now working in collaboration with both the mayor's office and IPS to grow new innovation schools and new charter schools where school leaders have the autonomy to make decisions as close to kids as possible. And then they're rigorously held accountable for results. So we see our role as uh, helping those institutions grow the number of high quality schools for kids. Uh, And given the uh, massive amount of change that's happened in our education system, it's very important that we're effectively engaging the community and that we're listening to folks, um, in particular, the folks that are most impacted by a lot of these changes. And, you know, that's the role that is, is critical moving forward. And that's why I'm really glad that Shannon's on board. That was a great segue, Shannon. Mm -hmm. So I I asked Brandon the question about, you know, what is the Mind Trust and what Mm -hmm. does it do for our community? But since he segued to you and you've been here, I believe you said a little over a year. Mm -hmm. Tell me what was your path to joining the Mind Trust and why this is an organization that you wanted to be on this team? Sure. So prior to joining the Mind Trust, I've been a journalist and worked in communications for my entire professional, my entire professional career. Um, but always been super passionate about education um, and advocating for marginalized communities. So I was president of the recorder for nearly 10 years. Um, And so through that work, you know, we work to educate and um, help improve conditions for marginalized communities. So I think that's what has been really attractive to me about the Mind Trust. I've been able to like really work for an organization that addresses systemic issues head on in a very aggressive way. Um, and when you look at the disparities, um, particularly around African American and Latino children, um, that urgency is so important. Um, and so it, should, it was just a natural fit. Once I met Brandon and we talked, I just fell in love with his spirit and his passion. He's incredibly talented um, and was just really eager to work for him. Um, and I think the dynamics of our relationship are really important um, to making you know our work together so successful. And I felt like we would be good almost instantly. I think I thought we would be a good team. So, Well, so far, so good. All right. So you mentioned, Brandon, the feedback of the community and really listening to what what it is they seek in their education environment for their children and, and for the community at large. What is the current landscape of that feedback? How, how has the IPS, the innovation, how has it all been embraced? And what's the evidence that tells you that this is still going the right direction? Yeah. Um, so when I've, one thing that I've learned in, in the years of doing this work is that systemic change is really hard. And, you know, systems have existed in this country now for hundreds of years that weren't necessarily created um, to provide opportunity for all people, regardless of skin color or their income or their background. And so when you're a nonprofit that sets out to change systems, you're inherently going to get pushed back. And, you know, I think a lot of us would be honest, the early years of the Mind Trust, we didn't value community engagement as much as we should. And we, uh, we really created a hole for ourselves. And for the past several years, we've acknowledged that for systemic change to stick and for it to be sustainable, it has to be led by those who are most impacted by the injustice that we're trying to solve. And that means that we have to listen to the community, that we have to ask families, what do you want to see in schools? It means that we need to invest in folks that reflect our kids and our community. Uh, And, you know, it just means that we need to make sure that we're leveraging the influence that we do have in order to empower others who are closest to the problem. And, you know, so what that looks like for us is 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 really a long term evolution from, you know, I, I think at first we had a lot of civic support. We had a lot of elected leaders who, you know, really appreciated the work of the Mind Trust. But the past, you know, several years and I would say the past year under Shannon's leadership, we've really tried uh, to make inroads in our grassroots community uh, and specifically with families. So we need to make sure that marginalized families that have not been at the table for generations are not only at the table, but they're driving change and they are organized and able to put pressure on the system to continue making decisions that are right for kids. And we see our role as working to empower families and neighborhood stakeholders to have the tools and the resources and the access necessary to effectively advocate for students. 
Um, you know, at the same time, we have some core beliefs at the Mind Trust. We believe that the combination of a transformative school leader, uh, school level autonomy, and rigorous accountability creates the conditions for a school to be successful. And we don't care what you call that school, but we do think that those are key conditions. And uh, when we look at where the education landscape is in 2019 versus where it was in 2001 when the charter school law passed, um, it's very different. So right now, about 52% of kids who attend public school within the geography of IPS attend either a charter school or an innovation school, schools where school leaders have contractual autonomy to make decisions at the school level. And we now have a growing body of research that says those schools are producing significantly more academic gains for students relative to how well those students would have done if they didn't have those options. And, you know, there's been multiple studies now from Stanford University. There's been um, one recent one from a group of researchers who were working out of IU. Um, we have state assessment results that just consistently say these schools are creating much better learning opportunities for kids. And our goal is how do you scale that up? to serve as many students as we can, and how is that done in collaboration with a community? And that, that with the community is just super important because this work's not gonna be sustainable if it's not being done with the folks that are most impacted. So, if the key to success includes the autonomy and the accountability, and I can't agree more, and you have the results that you just described, why retain any traditional models? <laughs> That's a great question. You must be an educator and really smart. <laughs> you know, uh, so so what I've learned when you're doing systems change is that you have to hold two thoughts in your mind at once. You have to be incredibly urgent and persistent, but you also have to have a semblance of patience uh, because these systems were created over hundreds of years. They're not going to be, um, you know, changed overnight. And the fact is, there's a lot of hardworking educators that are working in a traditional school system every day. There's a lot of kids who are, um, you know, who are, uh, who are in those schools and, you know, who are learning to some extent. And for us to transform the entire system in collaboration with the community, it means that at times this work is going to seem like it's methodical. At times it's going to drive us crazy that we're not moving more quickly but the reality is these systems are very durable and they were created to protect the status quo oftentimes. Uh, and bureaucracies um, get really calcified and it takes time to kind of, you know, chip away at the mindsets and, um, and to, you know, kind of make the progress as quickly as you would want. But I am, you know, really hopeful now that this work is at a scale where it's, it's hard for me to believe that it's going to be rolled back and families continue to vote with their feet and continue to enroll their children in many of these schools at unbelievably high levels, which gives us the confidence that there continues to be real demand for more high quality schools. And until every single kid in our community, especially kids of color, have access to a great school, we can't rest and we, and we got to continue to chip away at the system. So the fa I love that phrase, voting with their feet, because I really also believe that to be the case. So those that aren't voting with their feet, and you mentioned kind of this ground game of making sure you're talking to the families, the marginalized families, have you identified, are there some common denominators when they're not making a choice or making a choice for their neighborhood school potentially, um, even with that school having challenges, what, is their, what are they telling you? What is, what's, what's their reasonings? Reasoning for not for, for not choose for I guess maybe for choosing the school mm. that's selected for them because it's the closest to their home. Yeah, frankly, yeah, you know, oftentimes that that is one of the reasons. But I've found generally that they just don't know of the options that are available, or they think maybe you know because this charter school is performing well, maybe there's a, a cost associated with it. So there's a lot of like misinformation or just not being clear on, you know, the models and, and, and that these are public schools. And um, so I, I think um, primarily the reason is, um, you know, transportation. I'm all over the place. This is live. Oh, goodness. Um, um, 
but also yeah just not being very well very well aware of like charter schools and 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 the opportunities that present um also i think we haven't done a good job in this whole reform world of like talking about like the great strides of charter schools um when charter schools first came about in this community um they were they represented change and for a lot of people in the community change is very uncomfortable um and because the idea particularly around this organization um because we didn't socialize well enough with the communities there's a lack of understanding maybe a lack of trust but once we go into these communities talk to folks and really just talk about the data and let them know like these schools are performing better they understand um you know what these schools are performing better my children can go to these schools like i want to be a part of it um so i think it's like our responsibility to continuously educate the community on the positives of these schools and and to brendan's point earlier we don't get so caught up in school type we're all about like quality it just so happens the schools that we support are some of the you know they represent some of the best quality around in schools in the city so how do you infiltrate is the word like in my mind as i'm picturing this people who may be hesitant and it is funny right so one thing we all have in common we've all gone to school mm-hmm. and we all think it should look the way it looked when we did school so everybody has an opinion mm-hmm. how do you build trust in pockets where the trust may not exist what does that like what does that physically look like is it community meetings is it door to door is it kind of what's the what's it's the a little book? bit yeah it's a little bit of everything so one of the things i was committed to doing when i first started um was to have a lot of one-on-one meetings um, with folks in the community, particularly those individuals who were critics of our work or um, who just didn't quite understand. Um, and so when you talk about gaining trust, you just you have to go in a very authentic manner. And, you know, and, 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 and in doing so, like, you have to acknowledge the ills of the past, whether it's the 400 years of, you know, of, of discrimination or, you know, or the 12, 13 years of not socializing the community in a really, you know, comprehensive way. You have to acknowledge where things went wrong and you have to hear people out. Oftentimes it's, um, you know, going back to those same people multiple times because trust isn't built over overnight. They're not built, you know, um, after one meeting. Um, but we also do a, a number of things on a larger scale. So we partner with the United with UNCF for community conversations, and we invite the community to talk about some really um, intriguing, but also sometimes difficult conversations relative to education. We host um, a multitude of tours um, throughout the city of schools that are really performing um, because we want to expose the community to the schools. Um, so just a number of things. I think it 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 involves you know some you know the things on a larger scale, but also the one on one. Um, meetings and, and things on a smaller scale as well. So one big reflection that I had several years ago working for Mayor Ballard is uh, when we had to close a school and mm-hmm. and I was the person uh, because I was the charter schools director uh, who was responsible for relaying that information to families. And I... I sure we're clear here. Yeah. Is this the same school that I... Project school? Uh, no, this was Flanner House, uh, which was a couple years after the project school. I just wanted to disclose that if it was the same, because yeah. I did the PR when the project school was closed. Yes, and that and that and that that was also really painful, right? It, but I could just yeah. echo your point. Yeah, it's when you have to call these parents and have them make such a huge change in their daily routine, let alone in an institution that, in which they've trusted their children. It's a very difficult conversation, but one made necessary by reform. That's right, mm-hmm. and. It you know it kind of hit me when I was in a room with probably two or three hundred um, very upset families who had a right to be upset. That and I don't need to go into all the details, but uh, there was there was clear evidence that the school had uh, systematically cheated on the state test, um, and this had happened for multiple years. And uh, it wasn't just you know one teacher or one classroom; it was a systematic effort. Uh, you might actually remember this because you were at the DOE at I the do. time. And we could also disclose that, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> We've all each other for a and, long time. And I you know, I remember meeting in a conference room at the DOE getting briefed on the forensic analysis that did an analysis to see the number of wrong answers that were changed to right. And it was four standard deviations more in every single classroom across the school than what you would expect. And, you know, so then it was our job to act and 
uh, the mayor, uh, which is typical of Mayor Ballard, didn't give a crap about the politics. He wanted to do what was right for the kids. And even against the, the advice of his advisors, uh, he said, no, this school is not good for kids. And if we have other schools that are good for kids, then we're going to make sure that we're getting those kids into those schools. And he said, you need to do what you need to do, Brandon. But when I was standing in front of those two or 300 families as a young, privileged white man working for a Republican mayor, who actually is very progressive on these issues, right? But he was still a Republican mayor. Why in the world would those families trust me? Right? Every single thing in our country's history and in their lived experience says that they shouldn't have trusted me. And of course, at first, they didn't trust me. Uh, and, and that process showed me the value of coming back and coming back and coming back and showing folks your heart. And the same families that wanted me gone you know, that first night uh, were the same families that got phone calls from folks in our office every single day to make sure that they had access to a good school. They were the same families who knew that if they needed new school uniforms for their new school, we were going to pay for it, even if it was on our own credit cards. Um, and it just it just hit me that night that for work to be sustainable and for it to really be transformative, it can't be a bunch of outsiders coming in telling folks what to do. Because uh, every time an outsider has come into low-income communities with new shiny ideas, folks feel like they're lied to because nobody ever delivers on those promises. And so I actually think about that night a lot and think about how I can make sure that I'm empowering folks that actually do reflect our communities to lead this work over time. And you know, I think that's really the essential next step at the Mind Trust. How do we make sure that we're leveraging our influence in ways that are... Um, that promotes sharing real power with folks who are close to the problems. And how can we over time start to relinquish much of the influence that we have so that our grassroots community is really leading the charge over the long term? Talk about you. Sorry, you want to ask something, Robert? No, go ahead. Okay. Well, I want, this might push it back in your, your sphere. I want to talk a little bit of Brandon. You mentioned legislation or Indiana policies that from the very beginning that have made us as a state really second to none in terms of allowing for innovation and reform to happen. Talk about that, you know, the seat that you held at that time when really there was alignment probably from, I'm guessing, the mayor's office and the governor and change agents and yeah. people with influence in a lot of ways all really agreeing. Um, what about, what is that for a layman? What does that mean that Indiana has a, a legislative set of policies that are like no, no other? Yeah. So we, you know, so when you kind of scan the legislative landscape in terms of the education reform work that we're doing in Indiana, it, you're, you're hard pressed to find another state that has um, the suite of reforms that we have. Uh, we have the number one charter school law in the country. We have the innovation school law, which allows school districts to open up charter-like schools that live within the district, right? So it's a mechanism for school districts to lead reform on their own. And at least in IPS, what we've seen is that in 1970, they had about 105,000 kids. In 2015, they had about 29,000 kids. Literally lost kids every year for almost 50 years last three years, they've seen their enrollment go up, and that's because of the innovation school work, right? So this amazing lever for a school district to pull to lead the innovations from a school district and not wait for it to be done to you. Uh, we've seen reforms in how educators are evaluated, in my mind, with mixed results. Uh, we've seen, you know, again, I'm not endorsing this, but um, the most expansive school voucher law in the country uh, and in we've seen rigorous accountability at the state level. So all of that didn't go maybe as planned, but uh, it's hard to say, I think even the critics would say that um, there was a very clear uh, agenda that was accomplished in large part because of the incredible political alignment that you had um, at all levels of government. And what I would say is a lot, a lot, of, a lot of my friends who listen to this will probably think I'm ridiculous, but when Tony Bennett lost to Glenda Ritz, um, a lot of my friends 
wanted to go into mourning and, you know, just kind of wanted to throw up their hands and say it's all over. I actually think the mayor's office and I think me personally had a great relationship with Glenda Reds because at the end of the day, um, she wants a great education for kids. We want a great education for kids. We didn't always see eye to eye on the best way to get there. But we were able to develop a relationship with you know her and her team that allowed us to act really constructively, and we did a we did actually a surprisingly large amount of things together that most people don't even know, and it just reminded me of the power of folks on the right and the left coming together to accomplish big things. And I think when you think about kind of zooming back in locally, the three mayors, two Democrats, one Republican that have built off the work of each other to the point where now you can't be a credible mayor or a credible candidate for mayor in our city without supporting this stuff because it's so institutionalized. And it's the one issue that mayors of the two parties have put aside partisan differences and continued to really try to build on what the person before them started. And what I would like to get to is that same type of cooperation at the state level uh, because what happens locally with folks coming together uh, doesn't always happen at the state level. Do you think the, um, so I have to wonder, you know, as you kind of, there's there's so much learned, right? I mean, even some things in your answers, and I'm not going to point them out, make me think that if you had answered that same question 10 years ago, the answer would have sounded a little bit different, right? Um, and it kind of goes a long way to lessons learned. So I have to wonder if there was a, you know, the city fund, David Harris was a great podcast guest. It hasn't yet been published, but he talked about how the city fund is, if I understand it correctly, essentially looking to replicate, but maybe that's a strong word, the same design in other cities that are ripe for reform, education reform. And in my mind, there is a bit of a playbook or a strategy, right? And some of the things we just talked about would have to somewhat exist in those other locations in our country. Do you think part of the playbook someday will include where we are headed with our now appointed state superintendent versus an elected state superintendent? To your point about how to take it locally on a state level, is there any any validity in my thought process or... We'll see. Ask again in two years from now. And I wish I knew what David's answer was to this to see if we're aligned. And I'm sure we are generally. My my fear in all this is that we prescribe a playbook and just run the playbook in every major city in the country. And the reality is that every city is different and every city has a different context. And what works in Indianapolis may or may not work somewhere else. And I think what the city fund and other national leaders ought to guard against, and they know that I feel this way, is a one-size-fits-all prescriptive approach, regardless of local context. And I know that the folks at the City Fund, for example, know this and are deeply committed to making sure that their approach is specific to a certain city. Um, Without Mayor Peterson, who happened to be a Democrat, championing this law with Teresa Hubbard, sorry, championing this law with Teresa Lubbers uh, in 2001, we wouldn't be where we are today, right? If you take Mayor Peterson out of the equation, there likely wouldn't be a mind trust. There likely wouldn't be the incredible synergies that we have right now to grow high quality schools. And then if you think about the transition from Mayor Peterson to Mayor Ballard, right? Hard fought campaign, major upset. I think Mayor Ballard had every right in the world to say, we're going to scrap this crazy charter school stuff and we're going to go do something else. The only people on the 25th floor of the mayor's office that retained their jobs in that transition were the people on the charter school team. And the mayor not only continued the work, but expanded the work. So then when Mayor Ballard chose not to run again and was replaced by a Democrat, there was never a question what was going to happen with charter schools. Of course, the folks not only kept their jobs, but they were empowered to continue to build. And when I talk to folks across the country that don't have the history of strong mayoral leadership like we do here, they think that I'm just making up a story because most places don't have the expectation that a mayor is going to get in there and do big things regardless of party. And we've just been incredibly blessed for about 50 years to have a string of exceptional mayors. And I think if you take any of that out, right, if you take out Mayor Peterson, if you take out Mayor Ballard, if you take out Mayor Hoxat, um, it's almost like... Uh, you just lose the entire thing because this has been about relationships and it's been about leadership. And to be honest with you, I don't think a lot of cities across the country have 
those conditions, which is going to make it harder to run a playbook when you don't have courageous leaders. So part of that recipe um, is part of the recipe, though, having then a governor that is in alignment or an understanding or in support of. Was that important in Indiana's path? Yeah, it was it was for sure important to have somebody like Mitch Daniels, who had a clear vision for education and who had Tony Bennett. Uh, who was incredibly aligned with him. And it was obviously Tony's responsibility then to execute the governor's vision. Uh, when, you, when you have a lack of alignment with the chief executive and the person that's in charge of education policy, that's where you see a, a lot of the friction and I think a lot of the stalling um, as that relates to progress. So, so I do think just as a policy matter, it's important for the governor to be aligned with the education chief because it creates more coherent sets of policies um, that can be not only articulated, but I think executed across government. And I think that should go, or I think that should be true for either a Republican or a Democrat. It seems to me like whoever is the governor, they ought to have some sort of control over education policy. And I do think by appointing that position, you ensure that. Um, so, yeah. Do you think our voters are ready for that? Do, they, do you think... The, I, I actually agree a great deal to everything you just described. Um, but is our electoral ready for such a change? Um, you know, is it going to hit them by surprise in two years from now? And we'll what see. can we do as a community? What can we do to elevate the education conversation is now going to be important in your vote, both, you know, in your, in your governor? You know, I think so as a voter, right? So what I'm going to have to do now is I'm going to have to factor in education into my vote for governor. Right which you didn't have to do previously, right? Because the governor didn't have control over the system. So I do think it, it will, I think that, that kind of success of that model will hinge on well-educated voters who are actually able to incorporate their vision for education into their vote for governor. And I think the jury's still out around what that will look like. Uh, but my sense is moving forward, by appointing the state superintendent, you ensure alignment between the governor and the education chief which in a vacuum seems to me to be a pretty good thing. What's the balance across the country? Do you happen to know that that stat? There's only a handful of secretaries of education or whatever you call them that are elected. Um, just like the president's cabinet is not elected, mm -hmm. uh, most of these um, kind of role-specific jobs are either appointed by the governor or they're hired by a state board of education. Um, I think it's less than 10 are actually elected by the public. Uh, so there's actually more precedent for the direction that we're moving relative to the direction that we're leaving. That doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do, right? But from that standpoint, more states are now like Indiana. Um, and you know, I think that there's probably a lot to learn from around how other states have implemented that. What's your favorite success story in either in your experience, whether it's a school or a student or a family that you feel like the work has impacted? What's, what's one of your highlights? So there was, a, so earlier I mentioned like going on these one-on-one -on -one meetings and tours. So I also visited a lot of the schools that um, the Mind Trust has helped to incubate um, my first year. And so I was at, uh, I think it was, I believe it was Tinley, and I was talking to a parent who was in there volunteering, um, and, and she said, I asked her, like, what's so impressive about this school? She hadn't been there. Um, her, her child hadn't been there, I think, for only maybe a couple of couple of years. I said, so, you know, like, what made you switch? What was, you know, what really resonated and what's been a success for you? Uh, and so she really appreciated um, the sense of belonging that her, her child felt, the sense of accountability. Um, you know, she said she wanted her, you know, her son to be in a structured environment where he saw positive male role models who looked like him, um, and and he got that at Tinley, um, and how very intentional they were about promoting college. You know, uh, she was a single mother. She lives in an area that's pretty um, impoverished, um, and she didn't. She wants different. She wanted differently for her child, and she said Tinley was a vehicle to do that. And so when you think about like really making um, 
systemic changes and and really transforming individuals and transforming communities. I mean, that's really what it's all about. So when you have a school um, that has, you know, dynamic leaders who are able to make, you know, significant impacts on the lives of their students, not only academically, but personally, like she talked about how, you know, the school leaders and some of the educators like really made her son man up is the phrase that she used. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and how, you know, he began to, like, talk about things and, you know, before he was really bottled up. So I just think, you know, when you, you get that in a charter school and in an innovation school because um, because of that autonomy, sometimes I, I believe that schools are so rigid of for what, you know, educators and teachers and administration can or can't do that it kind of prohibits the, you know, the opportunity and the success of a child, like, long term. Um, so I think that's that's one of my big success stories that that's always resonated so i'm really cheap and i i get my haircut at great clips uh uh once every third sunday afternoon usually after the colts game if it's in the fall uh and i so i used to go to the great clips in brad ripple uh and oftentimes had the same um woman cut my hair and uh really formed a relationship with her and she 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 said one day, um, you know, hey, I've never told you this, but I've been attending school for the past couple of years, and I'm going to be graduating next week, and I'm no longer going to cut hair here because I'm not going to go get a new job and make more money. I said, really? So what school? And she said she went to the Excel Center, uh, which is a network of adult high schools run by Goodwill um, that are literally transforming lives every single day. Uh, and I started crying while she was cutting my hair. I was like, you know, you didn't know this, but I was the charter schools director mm-hmm. when that school was approved. And um, it's, it's, you know, it's really amazing now that you're going to have those opportunities. And, you know, she was probably 40 years old. She had, I think, three kids. Um, and, you know, it hit me that the work that we're doing is, 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 is real and it's meaningful and it's got a human face on it. Um, and it's now at a scale where, like, you can be anywhere. And chances are somebody in the building with you will have access to charter school or an innovation school and will have have had their life changed because of it. Um, I think there are a lot of stories like that, but that was just one that, that, that really resonated with me. You're listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, a local veteran public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana. The Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. I used to read this column in the recorder. (laughs) It was called Just Telling It. Mm -hmm. And this fellow named Amos Brown, who I think it's fair to say Mm -hmm. was a bit skeptical when this movement started. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, he was just skeptical. (laughs) Insert reason why here. Mm -hmm. But where I give him credit, and and I'm very lucky in the sense that he and I had a terrific friendship, Mm -hmm. uh, is that he was willing to be convinced. And it was Kariga Rausch who helped convince him, who Mm -hmm. was the charter school uh, boss up in Ballard's administration, retained by Ballard. Mm-hmm. He'd worked for David Harris and worked for Peterson, along with Marcus Robinson, who mm-hmm. at the time was running Tinley. Uh, Amos was willing to be convinced. Shannon, you knew Amos as well or better as anyone. Why do you think he changed his mind on the need for this sort of movement? Yeah. So, as you know, like Amos, he loves statistics. He was a data guy. And, you know, I think his initial reservations were reflective of the community in general. Um, Just wasn't very aware of the work. A little skeptical because of, you know, some of the things that hadn't been done on the front end. But I think once Kariga and Marcus went before him and they probably presented a lot of data to support um, the success of these schools and why they were so necessary, because he was such a, um, a numbers guy, he couldn't, he could not dispute that. Um, and so I think 
that's probably that was probably the biggest thing. He, you know, he wasn't a touchy feely guy who, you know, would just agree with you because he liked you as an individual. He had to have something concrete to support his to, you know, to support his support of you. Um, and so I, I imagine that's what it was. Yeah. And he went to Northwestern, as mm-hmm. I recall. Mm-hmm. So he knew the value of education. Would it be accurate in terms of opinion, if not necessarily fact, to call school reform, and I know that phrase in and of itself is controversial, um, but to call the, the movement to allow parents to have more choices and to increase accountability, is it fair to call that an urban core movement? In other words, in the more rural communities, how many charter schools are there? What percentage of charter schools are in counties that have disproportionately white, let's say 90 percent, mm-hmm. you know, not big urban uh, concentration, for mm-hmm. lack of a better term? It's an urban core movement. Mm-hmm. Is that a fair? I think so. Yeah. When you think about the, the folks most impacted and, and by the education inequities and you think about those who now have better access and resources because of Reform, yeah, I think that's a fair, a fair statement. Is it then more satisfying to the mind trust, Mayor Peterson, David Harris, two of you, your staff, when you're able to win over people and leaders and families in the urban core who were skeptical? What is that like? When someone comes to you and says, say it's an elected official, no names, just say it's an elected official or a community leader or a pastor who says, you know, I was I I wasn't down with this 10 years ago, but now I see I see the results. Mm -hmm. What's that like? Because you, Shannon, particularly Mm -hmm. have seen it from both sides, Mm -hmm. from a member of the media Mm -hmm. and as an activist within the family. It's refreshing. You know, I mean, that's why we do the work like. We do the work to, you know, be impactful. We do the work to make a difference, to provide better access to equity. So when we're able to um, convert or sway over a critic, I mean, it's, it's refreshing. And it's really, it, it's, it gives me inspiration, too, because I think oftentimes they are the best, like, influencers of, of reform work. They were critics. They understand um, why they were initially opposed to it, but they've, you know, been enlightened. Um, And so I think they can, you know, do a better job of um, convincing others to at least start listening or, you know, or, you know, considering charters. So I I think it's definitely refreshing. Um, It reminds us, you know, that even when the work gets tough and and overwhelming at times, it's necessary. And, you know, that, you know, we see value in it. Um, So, yeah, I think it's great. You know, so I, so I think one of the most um, interesting and disturbing trends that, that, that we see both locally and nationally when it comes to support for school choice is, I, I'm just going to call it what it is, the erosion of support from white folks um, who have had the economic means to always have school choice. And those that, that group of folks tend to be the loudest when it comes to trying to fight against school choice for all kids. Um, And when you look at the polling data, when you just kind of look at the on the ground data, um, there are, it's just clear that the vast majority of families of color um, support charter schools, support the innovation schools and want there to be more high quality choices. Um, That's actually not what we see from white progressives the majority of white progressives are actually against the work that we're doing. And as a white guy, like I got a lot of work to do with other white folks to, you know, have the hard conversations, certain other white. (laughs) Yes. To, to, you know, have to have the hard conversations around, you know, the certain amount of privilege that you inherently have because of the color of your skin and where you live. Uh, and you know, sometimes folks can talk a good game and can virtue signal how much they believe in equity, but when push comes to shove, our actions don't always match our rhetoric. 
And I think we got to make a lot of inroads with white folks um, to to actually join the fight and to make sure that um, that we are empowering everybody uh, to have access to good schools, regardless of income or race or geography. And I, I think it's incumbent upon us as white people to have those conversations with, with other white people. Uh, uh, and I think that the national political discourse right now is 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 just really divisive when it comes to this issue and makes the local work harder. When you've got candidates for president that have supported charter schools in the past, and now that that's not cool anymore in their party, they're now either ignoring that support or they're you know completely kind of reversing their stances, um, even when they know that about 75% of black voters who identify with their party are supportive of this stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's a real problem for folks in the ground that are doing this work. And I think, you know, we need to start calling this out for what it is. Uh, and I think it's incumbent upon me and other white folks, you know, to kind of have these conversations and be relatively courageous about those conversations. Shannon, you are a graduate of Broad Ripple High School, 2000 mm-hmm. something. And... <laughs> You're younger than me. <laughs> yeah, put it that I'm way. younger, but older than some in this room. <laughs> yeah. IPS has, and it was mentioned earlier. IPS has has gone through the ringer. Uh-huh. Some of it its own fault. Mm-hmm. In the last, I graduated in '86, okay. so let's say that's 33 years. Yeah. Some of it not its own fault. The collapse of the industrial base, particularly mm-hmm. on the east side, mm-hmm. and the fleeing of families to try to find jobs and industries that are new because the jobs and industry that were uh, venerable were gone. But, and I worked for him and directed the IPS referenda, I should disclose, but I really believe starting with people like Mary Ann Sullivan and Superintendent Farabee, things really started to change. Mm -hmm. What is your take on IPS 2019 And what advice would you give the new superintendent, Alicia Johnson? Mm -hmm. That's a a great question, Robert. Um, I went to IPS. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. You know, I am really confident in IPS 2019. I think um, Alicia Johnson is, you know, the best qualified person to to serve in that role. Um, I think you know, when you think, when you look at, and this is, I'm putting my media hat back on, especially when Farabee um, was superintendent, when you look at his style um, and um, how he communicated or maybe didn't do so well with communicating um, to the community, to, you know, teachers and staff and and, and so forth, I think um, Alicia will, you know, definitely be different in that regard Um, because there are so many challenges within the district that are generations deep she's going to have to be bold in her leadership Um, she's going to have to make some decisions that might um, be unpopular for some but necessary and important um, and data driven too Um, but I am like definitely confident in her ability there's a lot of pressure on her you know she's the first African American and I just am adamant um, that the standards are higher for African Americans. The standards are higher for women in general. Um, so she's got a lot of pressure, but I think her stro- shoulders are broad and she's strong and um, super talented. And so I think if there's anyone um, to execute and to um, turn the district, to continue to turn the move the needle on the district, it's it's Alicia. I, I, I just think I couldn't be more impressed with her and her ability. Does the school reform movement need broadened? Do we need charter schools in rural communities? Do we need that competition? I mean, it's easy to do a quick scan of test scores and SAT scores and graduation rates. And, and you know, to, to Brandon's point earlier, my kids went and go to Roncalli because we're Catholic and we made that decision and we were able to make that decision. But not far outside of just because you're not in an urban school district and just because you're not in an urban setting doesn't mean there shouldn't be competition for schools and school districts 
that maybe have four or 500 kids and it's maybe the only school within five or 10, 15, 20 miles because of the rural nature of the setting. When do you think and how important do you think it is for the reform slash choice movement to reach those communities as well? It's a great question. Question we just spent two <laughs> hours on today. Um, I mean, I would even take this up further. There are school districts inside of Indianapolis that have uh, massive disparities, uh, in particular for students of color and for low-income students. And it's my opinion that the exclusive focus on IPS has masked a lot of the challenges that we see in school districts inside of Marion County. And the constant attention on IPS really, in some ways, lets those districts off the hook for confronting the brutal facts, right? The brutal fact is that there's a 48% achievement gap between white students and black students in Washington Township. It's where I live. Um, If you are a third grader in Washington Township, and if you're white, you're eight times more likely to be identified as high ability than if you were black in third grade. These conversations haven't been had in the public, uh, I think for a variety of reasons, but one of those reasons is because the focus has been on IPS. And I do think that we need to broaden the conversation and we need to make sure that uh, more kids have access to great schools. I think that's true for township districts. I think that's true for rural areas. And I think it's true for a lot of our mid-sized cities across the state that that are going through some challenging times right now. Now, whether or not that means the Mind Trust is going to expand all those school districts, that's very unlikely. Though I do think um, it should be our moral responsibility to make sure that we're starting these conversations uh, and that we're ensuring that there's a light shining on the inequities and that there are folks that are committed to working with communities to help to solve it. Danielle, you have one last quick question before we do the five questions? Mm. Well, my thought process is really around kind of what's next. You know, there's a lot of work that you've continued to, it sounds, of the Mind Trust specifically in terms of incubating school concepts and supporting autonomy and school leaders and all the things. But to make systemic change, to your point, it takes a lot. Is there something in your strategic plan at the Mind Trust that you're thinking, A, I'm excited about this? And you want to talk about because in three years from now, it'll be the thing that you're going to say this made a difference. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah. Uh, So just a couple of months ago, we launched a new fellowship, um, an education um, entrepreneur fellowship centered around parent advocacy. Um, So we understand um, that parent voice has been eliminated from the education conversation for literally generations. And that's not the best thing to do. And because we believe in equity and we believe in being inclusive, we wanted to make sure that all voices have a seat at the table. Um, And our way to ensure that was to launch this fellowship. So we um, have a very talented and super compassionate person, um, Ashley Vierden, who uh, is our fellow. And right now she's getting like wonderful training from organizers um, throughout the country. She's learning, she's building her base, but ultimately she will launch her own independent parent-led advocacy organization, totally independent um, of the Mind Trust. And so when you talk about like systemic changes, I mean, I think that's really like putting our money where our mouth is. We're investing over a half million dollars in in, in her fellowship. Um, And, you know, we're working to give her the skills to um, to launch this organization, and, and, and that's really been transformative, um, and just really excited about that. Uh, on the other on the other end, we are like at the beginning stages of a strategic planning process. Right now, we're just um, in the gat- the, the uh, data gathering stages. So we'll soon be having conversations with folks um, at all levels of the community um, to just hear their thoughts on on the work that we do what we what they feel like we should be doing better at maybe what we shouldn't do at all um and and i think that'll drive our our plan and our vision um you know for the future but just really excited about the fellowship really excited um that we continue to um recruit and train like talented education leaders most of whom are people of color um really excited that the schools we support have really strong support systems um and and they are you know being very um 
impactful in the lives of their students. So, I don't know. Well said. I've got nothing to add. <laughs> you are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, the Crown Plaza Hotel and Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, and McAllister Machinery, your friendly neighborhood Caterpillar dealer. We are here with Brandon Brown and Shannon Williams of the Mind Trust, and they are about to be subjected to the five questions. Ready? Go first. I guess so. <laughs> All right. Do you want to go ladies first or CEO first? CEO first. Oh, man. <laughs> Brandon's faster on his feet. What was your first job? <laughs> uh, mowing lawns in my neighborhood. Shannon? Burger King, 52nd and Keystone. After I went to school, at, after school at Robert Bull. <laughs> what was your first concert? <laughs> the Beach Boys with my mom. <laughs> <laughs> New edition. Marcus Square Arena. <laughs> the generational difference in these answers it's with our guests. Tremendous, yeah. If you could recommend any book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take liberty with this. I'm gonna say the 1619 project by the New York Times, which I'm making my way through. Uh, that provides kind of an alternative history of our country and maybe provides some some nuance um, when it comes to the African American perspective. I think right off the bat, I would say the warmth of other suns. It's talking about the great migration of um, of blacks from the south. Um, to you know, the west side of the country and north. So it talks about the the you know injustices throughout, but also how post World those, War II migration. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But also how those um, those individuals and in, you know were able to build strong black communities in their respective cities. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great book. I'm also reading Howard Fuller's book. Uh, no struggle, no progress, which really talks about education, um, education reform, and how you know it's an ever-present work that we have to do. Brandon, if you could witness any event in history, be there in person as it happens. Which event would you choose? Um, outside of the Colts winning the Super Bowl this year, that would be nice. Go Jacoby Brissett. Good start. Um, man, um, I would say it would have been, it would have been really interesting to, and I'm going to take liberty with your question. Uh, I have a adopted sister from China. Um, and I think it would have been really, um, amazing to have been in the orphanage with my mom and dad when they saw her for the first time. Mm. Terrific answer. Shana? <sighs> that's that's pretty deep, Brandon. <laughs> Any event in history. You know, I'm a fan of Barack Obama, and so I would have loved to been in the room um, as, the tal- as the votes were being counted. Um, election night. Too election night, night yeah. And, and, and just to take it, in, take it all in. Um, but more... More importantly, just to like observe. So I'm reading. I've read Michelle Obama's book as well, and and so you kind of get an inside look on, on on that night. But I would just love to have been able to to witness that as an individual. Last question: If you could have dinner with anyone living today, two hours off the record, just the two of you, whom would you choose? Shannon. <laughs> <sighs> Probably uh, Oprah Winfrey. Yeah. It's a good one. Um, I'll say a random answer. Uh, Jim Mattis, to hear what he went through as the Secretary of Defense for our current president. Former General, former Secretary of Defense, Mad Dog Mattis. Hmm. Thank you, Danielle, for co-hosting today and bringing your considerable education, knowledge, and experience to bear for the people who are listening to this podcast. The transformation of Indianapolis, as as hopefully chronicled in the Leaders and Legends podcast, 
is really a series of stories of people. And it's not people necessarily being individuals, but coming together for the common good. And whether it's uh, the building of stadiums or the construction of organizations such as the Parks Foundation and others, uh, Indianapolis's current state could neither be predicted 50 years ago or preordained. But what is certainly true is that at the absolute forefront on the Mount Rushmore of organizations of the last half century that are changing lives at every level, the Mind Trust is there. We're very, very grateful, not only to David Harris, who has come on our podcast, but also to Brandon and Shannon for your time and your work and your passion and your friendship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. Thank you.